And welcome to another episode of The Focal Thought. My guest today is Donna Matthews. How are you, Donna? Hi, I'm good, thanks. How are you? Good, good, thanks. Thanks again for coming on the show. Um, just in the way of an introduction, Donna, you've worked with children, families, and schools, and you run a private practice with a focus on giftedness and other special needs. And you were the executive director, Millennium Dialogue on Early Child Development, University of Toronto, and founding director, Hunter College Center for Gifted Studies in Education, City University of New York. And you've published many, many articles and book chapters. And you are the co-author of some books, Being Smart About Gifted Education, The Development of Giftedness and Talent Across the Lifespan, the Rootledge International Companion to Gifted Education, and recently Beyond Intelligence, Secrets for Raising Happily Productive Kids. So welcome. Well, thank you. All, all of that is good. All of that is true, um, except that I'm no longer running a private practice. Um, these days, I'm mostly writing. I do a little bit of consulting, but mainly I'm writing. So. Okay, okay. No, that's great. Awesome. So you've put in the work and I sort of focusing on different things. Yep. Okay, awesome. So I wanted to speak to you, um, you know, about the children and specifically the aptitude of children, uh, the intelligence of, you know, raising a child, also, you know, raising a child that has, you know, sometimes developmental challenges, as well as on the other spectrum, you know, having a gifted child, you know, both have, you know, needs that have to be finely attuned, you know, to, to themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and, you know, intelligence is something it's, I don't really think it's a word that can be used on its own. It should be used in context because I find too often when you say someone is intelligent, you know, they can have a very high IQ. They might be able to, you know, memorize the Encyclopedia Britannica. But, you know, personally for me, um, intelligence without um, use of that, you know, you have to become the intelligence, you know, that's my sort of second layer. And the third yeah. layer, you know, which is also personal, I feel when you become that intelligence, you have to contribute back to, to society. And even if mm -hmm. you don't do those things, that's okay. You know, you can act as a consultant or, you know, you can act as a counselor, you, know, you can be the, the source of knowledge. So in your work, what is it that you see that, you know, makes for gifted children, for very highly intelligent children? Yeah, I mean, and I 100% agree with you that there are many kinds of intelligence. There's social intelligence, there's musical intelligence, there's mathematical intelligence. It's, intelligence is contextual. I, I agree with that perspective completely. Um, the, um, you know, one of the things I've been focusing on lately is writing books for parents who want to support the development of their kids' intelligence and, and not necessarily raise gifted kids, but sort of encourage their children's intelligence to develop as well as possible. And, and as you mentioned earlier, as usefully as possible. And so do you want me to talk a bit about some of the things that the research shows as, as leading to that kind of um, so things that parents can do that can support the development of their kids' intelligence? Yes, definitely. And if you don't mind prefacing it with, you know, what we should look for in terms of intelligence, you know, as sort of like uh, an edge uh -huh. on, on okay. development. And then, you know, get into that for sure, please. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what we look for, I mean, I think you, you've already identified the important things. It's intelligence in action and intelligence in context. So it's kids, um, you know, what you're looking for to begin with really is curiosity. And so um, if you have a child who is curious, one of the, the most important things you can do is like, listen, like really listen to the kid and respond to their questions, pay attention to those curiosities, um, support them in taking them farther. So if you have a child, for example, who's very interested in, in music, then look for ways to introduce musical activities into their li life in, in all the ways you can think of, sort of casually, sort of singing a song about what, are you, what you're doing. Here we are going to the store, you know, so that's 
just be as um, introduce music in as many ways as you can to their experience. So support that, put music on for them to listen to. As they get a bit older, take them to sort of casual musical events, uh, you know, have a karaoke machine. Like, uh, so pay attention to your child's curiosities is, is one of the most important things you can do. One of the interesting things that the research on the brain is showing that I think is, is really interesting is um, the importance of love. If, if a child experiences dependable and consistent warmth and kindness and patience from you know, one or more adults in their life, that seems to be the most important thing for the development of their intelligence. It sort of creates a security that encourages the curiosity and the learning. Wow, okay. Yeah, it's interesting, right? Like it's sort of old fashioned, but just love your child and be there, show up for them, be present. Um, you know, some parents like to think that it's, it's um, what matters is quality time. So they don't have to be very present. They can work 200 hours a day. You know, it doesn't matter. The kid can be in daycare. Well, actually being present with quantity time does matter. So having some, especially, you know, the, the younger the child, the more important that quantity of time matters. Um, so, I mean, it's certainly possible for a child to be spending a lot of hours in daycare and still do great, still become very smart and competent and happy and all those good things. But um, the best thing you can do for your, your young child in particular is to show up, to be present in a loving, patient, dependable, warm way. Yeah, that's a very good point because if, you know, you can't daydream properly if you're thinking about the bills, right? So, I mean, you need to yeah, you have true. that basic cushion. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you've identified curiosity as one of the main driving factors. And, you know, I've, I've heard that, you know, in, in some of the, the research I've read. And I'm really glad you pointed that out because that's the main thing. I think, you know, people are born naturally curious. Babies are curious. You know, they're always mm -hmm. looking yep. around, you know, with sight and with hearing and, you know, tasting. And yes. yeah. there, there's no judgment to that curiosity. They're just sort of, you know, trying to make yep. sense of things. So we use exactly. that as a clue. Okay, yeah. and then you were mentioning uh, some of the research you wanted to talk about. Yeah, I mean, it, if if you want to support the development of your child's intelligence, thing number one is love in action, the most important thing. Thing number two is listen, really listen, you know, respond to their questions, pay attention to their worries, just sort of being present in a patient, kind way. Um, another thing, and, and these are sort of, these are, not what parents expect when they ask me, okay, you know, because my work has predominantly been around giftedness and gifted development. Um, and parents seem to think there's going to be some magic answer. Well, th there sort of is, but it's all about love you know, and listening. It's, it's very old fashioned values that best support the development of children's intelligence. Um, something else, again, that, that some parents don't seem to realize is the importance of playtime. Um, so play is the work of childhood. Many experts have said that through the years. And kids need to play in order to learn. So early learning in particular is very playful, no matter the domain, whether it's math or nature or whatever it is, it's playful. So kids, kids need lots of time for play. It's not a waste of time if your child wants to play. In fact, encourage that. Uh, kids need lots of outdoor time and sort of physical exercise. Those are really important brain builders too. Um, they need time for playing with other kids or the social interaction. Social interactions are what drive 
language development and a whole bunch of other things. A desire to be competent comes from interacting with others. So if you want to support your child in getting smart, play with them yourself, but then also look for other kids that they can play with. Because that, that social interaction is a really important driver of intelligence. Um, something else, and, and you talked about it a minute ago, is the importance of sensory stimulation. All the senses from birth onward, give your child opportunities to explore and develop all their senses. You know, taste, hearing, vision, etc. And then, you know, back to the curiosity factor, when they seem especially interested in something, help them find ways to learn more about that. I mean, uh, do you want me to keep going? <laughs> Don't just, uh, yes, yeah, okay. just really good things. Because I mean, you know, the, all of these things you're mentioning, they seem quite fundamental. And, you know, we seem to, I think, take it for granted because we almost want yeah. to start them on the university degree right away, right? Sometimes. Exactly. And, and you know, the research is really solid that baby Einstein is not what the kid needs. They don't need the, the brain building, fancy, expensive toys and experiences. What they need are these real basics, sensory stimulation, playtime, somebody listens to them. Um, as they get a bit older, it's good to focus on emotion regulation, self-control. So your child learns to, to have persistence, perseverance, focus, those kinds of things, sort of managing the emotions, that's actually more important overall over the lifespan to success in every area of life than IQ is. So focusing on IQ or intelligence or knowledge and, and not focusing on the emotion uh, management, so learning to control your reactions to things. Um, and develop this persistence and perseverance. If, if you only focus on intelligence, you're missing the mark. If you want your kid to actually uh, develop their intelligence and be successful over time and happy, um, that self-control piece is, is essential. And oh. so, yeah, it's, it's again, it's, it's one of those things that can be, easily overlooked as not part of intelligence, but it really is. Uh, balance is important. One of the things that's showing up more and more in the brain research and in the child development literature, very much including around the development of intelligence is the importance of mindfulness. So learning how to be present in the here and now, learning to attend to this moment now is, I mean, for one thing, it's one of the best ways to develop emotion regulation, but it's also really important in, in sort of developing uh, all kinds of abilities, including every kind of intelligence. So giving kids tools for learning mindfulness, and you can do that starting really young, like age two, kids can learn to be more attentive to the present moment. You can help them, your breathing exercises are one of the sort of simplest, easiest ways to become mindful. Helping kids learn to pay attention to their breath. And, wow. and that kind of thing is also helpful in, you know, some kids have a lot of trouble going to sleep. Some kids who have very active minds have problems with sleep. And so giving them breathing exercises, mindfulness practices can, can help with that. And so that's like a bridge to, you know, in, in terms of supporting your kids' development until, of their intelligence, this sort of sounds, again, not something that a lot of people would think about, but nourishing food, enough sleep, physical exercise, all those physical things are really important brain builders. 
Wow. This is great because you've touched on so many varied categories, you know, like with diet, um, yeah. physical exercises, um, mindfulness, you know, some meditation. You've touched yeah. on play, curiosity, you know, social interactions. It almost seems like intelligence is basically a byproduct if you manage these, these basic facilities. Yeah, I think, I think that's a really good way to look at it, that sort of all the things that are important to healthy development of a child lead to the development of their intelligence. So really parents, I think, should first, you know, I've always felt, you know, figure themselves out, you know, their strengths and weaknesses, yeah. or even getting into dealing with, you know, raising children. Um, because then you know, you'll know what such... your limitations are, you'll know what you need to pass and what not to pass on to your children. You know, I love what you just said. And I, I wish I had said it. It's like, it's really important. The first advice I should give a parent is it starts with you. You know, you're absolutely right that that the parent themselves has to become reflective and mindful in order to become patient and provide the love in action that their child needs. That's you're so right. Yeah, I've actually, you know, on my um, bathroom mirror, when my kids were first born, it fogged up and I wrote a saying there saying, as you are, so shall they be. You know, it yeah. comes from, you know, kids modeling their parents. And and my goal was, you know, from reading that the, the subconscious mind develops, you know, between zero to seven. Yeah. So that's your window of opportunity. Yep. And I knew that I wasn't the, the perfect parent. So I said that every year, my sort of intention on their birthday would be, how can I make the, the next year better for myself? You know, I have to transform. And by doing that, my kids will will naturally transform. And I think it's one of those things that, you know, by the time they grow up and they leave the house, I might have almost start to have figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. I love that. That is such a fabulous practice to think every year. Okay, how, how can I get a little bit better? It's funny because I'm, I'm just finishing writing a book with, that has the title Imperfect Parenting, how to build a relationship with your child that will weather the test of time. And, and you have described like imperfect parenting is, is exactly what I'm trying to say to parents is you are not perfect. Of course, you're not. You're human. So if you can let that be OK, not to be perfect, and then acknowledge it as you sort of bump up against your imperfections, and, you know, one of the things, so you've got kids who've already left home. So you know deeply that your children, once they become like preteens and then teenagers, they are going to point out your flaws with, with, with such severity. You know, if you had any illusions of perfection, they are lost by the time you have teenage kids. Wow. <laughs> no, that's good. I like that because it, you know, and with, with keeping with, um, with gifted children, mm -hmm. you know, like, like you're saying, the, the imperfect parent, you know, you have to, um, you know, figure yourself out because with, with gifted children, it's not like you've got like a hall pass, right? It's, it's not easy. In fact, oh, it can be even yeah. more work because once you recognize that gift, you have to really work a lot, I imagine, right? To nurture that yeah. gift because they are able to lose the gift, right? If not well, developed. Yeah. Properly. Okay. Um, you have to work a lot. The, um, yeah, so the, the early focus of my, my work in this field was on addressing the learning needs and the social emotional needs of kids who are exceptionally advanced compared to other kids of their age. And there are problems, problems come up. A kid who, for example, is linguistically advanced. So she's six years old and, and is able to express herself in a way that, that an adult might, you know, and I, I've certainly known children like that. Well, other kids and many adults look at that kid and think they're weird. I mean, because they are, they are exceptional, just like a child with learning problems is exceptional. A child who is exceptionally advanced in one area or another, other people can react to that kid like they're weird. And, and so there are real issues. And that's, 
you know, a book that Joanne Foster and I have just written, Being Smart About Gifted Learning, which uh, sort of is the next uh, edition of the Being Smart About Gifted Education that you mentioned earlier. Um, you know, we, we talk about the learning needs of kids who are exceptionally advanced in one area or another. And what do you do about it? You've got to do something because if you've got a child, let's say you've got a kid who's in grade three, but they've got the mathematical knowledge and intelligence of a kid who's in grade 10. Well, it's going to make that kid crazy if he's expected to do grade three work. You know, you're going to make the kid at the very least frustrated and unhappy and sometimes behavior problems crop up or disengagement from school. And this is what you talked about a minute ago where kids can, you know, and I wouldn't say lose their giftedness, but they, they get disengaged from their area of original curiosity and, and um, giftedness. So you can, you can create a kid who hates math, starts out as mathematically gifted, but his teachers expect him to do the age level work. So what Joanne and I do in being smart about gifted learning, as well as the previous books in that series, is talk about what you can do with that kid, how to keep him engaged in learning in his area of big curiosity and ability. So there are a lot of things that parents and teachers can do to, to sort of accommodate ex the, the child's giftedness in a way that will engage them in continued learning. Without, oh, yeah. Because with without school, I imagine there's no one size fits all, of course, right? It's well, yeah. And, and unfortunately, too often, you know, it is one size fits all. And most educators, most teachers, principals, and so on are very sensitive to the child with learning problems. They realize that that child needs some kind of accommodations or adaptations in order to keep learning. So, so that's sort of obvious to most people in education. The, for giftedness, it's different though. It's not always obvious when a child has exceptional giftedness in one area or another. You know, all, all that educators sometimes know is that that kid is able to do more than the other kids. So they get A plus, A plus, A plus. And so they're just a good student. But sometimes like the little boy I talked about a minute ago, who might be in grade three, working at grade 10 in math, that kid is not just very good at math. He's like amazingly good and way advanced and he needs something different so that the one size fits all who are capable model that is often used is, is not going to work for that kid at all. Sure. Yeah. And you know, he, that kid might be, um, you know, good in math, but that's just the, the category, you know, that the, the kid excels in because at the same time, emotionally, maybe the range is low and the kid might bite your arm. Absolutely. Off right fit, so <laughs> for sure, for sure. And this gets back to our original conversation about the nature of intelligence it is contextual, it's context specific. So people, you know, virtually everybody has like a profile of different levels of ability in different areas. So you might be ex extremely high mathematically, 99.9th percentile in math, and then maybe at 60th percentile, you know, better than 60% of the population in language say, but then you might be at the 20th percentile. So worse than 80% of the population in social emotional development. I mean, there's, everybody has their own different profile. You got it. Yeah. So with the, with the kid like that, you know, if they're exceptional at math, some things you can do to keep them engaged, maybe, you know, I'm just thinking off the top, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe let them sort of be as a, you know, uh, a model and a tutor to some of the other kids who aren't doing well in class, maybe give them extracurricular work. Well, and, you know what? Okay. Let's, let's stop with that. Yeah. Extracurricular can be great, yeah. but not everybody who's advanced in a subject area is good at helping people who don't get it so easily. So, 
you know, and, and not everybody likes to be a teacher. So mm-hmm. it was certainly some of the exceptionally capable kids I've worked with have been used as teacher's aides by their teacher yeah. and hate it. You know, they just, they're working with this kid who isn't getting it and they're slow. And the, the kid with the gifted learning ability isn't enjoying that other child's slow learning process. That's not fun for them. I mean, it is for some, some people are natural teachers and they enjoy supporting development of learning in kids who are having problems with it. But kids who find learning in one area or another, in in math in particular, it seems to be a kid who finds it really easy to learn math often doesn't know what the processes are that get them to the answer. It's just obvious to them. It has become automatic. Their learning has become automatic. They know how to do it, but they can't explain to the other child how to do it. So, So it's one of the classic mistakes that people make is they see a kid who's good at something and they assign them to work with somebody who's not so good at it. Sometimes that's great. Often it's terrible. The other problem with that, sort of using the smarter kids as the teacher's aides, is that the smarter kid doesn't get a chance to further development their own learning, further develop their own learning. So so it also sort of impedes their continued accelerated pace of learning. No, that, that's a good point because the, the teacher role is, is very different. You have to be okay with, like you're saying, development, yeah. learning. I mean, I've always often found that, you know, teaching is a good way for me to understand, you know, a subject better. But with these gifted kids, they already understand it. So they don't. Well, you know, I mean, it teach. varies, Croydon. It yeah. varies. Some of these kids are, are natural teachers and they love that process of, of helping another yeah. child. But many of them are not. They're impatient and And they just want to continue with their own learning. You know, I've also heard that with gifted children, they um, maybe because they're insightful, um, they have this passion for justice. You know, you were mentioning impatience. Also, when they see, you know, unfairness in the world, they get very irritable by it. Um, Well, okay. And and again, the, the context specificity of intelligence comes in. Some kids are incredibly insightful and feel injustice deeply so you're absolutely right and they care like you know take a, you know think about Greta Thunberg or um, mm-hmm. Malala Yousafzai you know these young people who who are extremely smart and and saw injustices and wanted to write them and you know they're they're kids who do get involved with stuff like that but you know lots of kids who are exceptionally advanced compared to their age peers are not insightful at all. That's that sort of social emotional kind of intelligence is a special kind of intelligence that some kids develop to a gifted level and, and many don't. Yes, no, no, definitely. We can't, uh, I, I can't generalize. For, for exactly. And that is one of the things around giftedness, gifted education, that a lot of people do think that, sort of gifted children are they there are certain characteristics that that characterize giftedness like a keen uh reaction to injustice um and that's so wrong some kids with gifted learning needs do have that and many do not that would that would be as variable among the the gifted learners as among the general population yes no no for sure and then, you know, from your research, why would you say, you know, or how do these children procure, you know, these sort of gifted talents? Is it, you know, the genes, the DNA that gives them a head start, or have they just reached consciousness or awareness development faster than the other kids? Or what are your thoughts yeah. on that? I mean, that's sort of back to our original conversation as well. I mean, I think that that we are all born with some sort of genetic um, predispositions to find certain kinds of learning easy and other kinds of learning harder. But the most important aspects, I, in, in my opinion, are the environmental aspects like 
love your child, be present, be kind, listen to them, lots of time for play. So those are all the things that build the brain. The brain is not fully formed at birth. The brain develops from, from conception on. And it is, it is like a very, it's in some ways it's like a muscle that it requires work to develop. Um, but you certainly don't start off smart. You know, babies don't smart, start off knowing anything. So, so it's the environment that, that it's the environment in combination with the, the infant and child's temperament, um, as well as some genetic predispositions. Got it. Yeah. And I like that um, you say that the, the brain develops from, from, you know, once the child yeah. is conceived, because, you know, for listeners out there who are listening to this and, you know, maybe their, their children are, you know, five years or 10 years and, you know, they're thinking, wow, I should have done this, you know, before when they were born, but that still means they have time that they can do it now. Yes. With plasticity, right. They can catch up. Absolutely. Thank you for, for mentioning that. I'm really glad you did. You're absolutely right. You start where you are right now and, and the brain is plastic. It develops, it develops right through the lifespan, unless there's some kind of brain disease, you know, that develops and, and that can impede the brain's growth, but no matter what your child's age is, start now. Start now. Start now and go forward. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. Be here now, you know, in, in terms of your the development of your child's intelligence and everything else. Well, that's awesome. Listen, Donna, thanks again for, for coming on the episode and you know sharing your thoughts with us. And if a uh, people want to get a hold of you, uh, where's the best place uh, to reach you? Um you know what the psychology today i have a blog on psychology today and you can get all my contact information there so if you go to psychology today and look up donna matthews donna spelt with one n matthews with two t's you can find me okay and i'll put that in the show notes i encourage the listeners also to you know check out donna's work and you know read her articles uh, there's one that i read on two i seeing it. it's really great it's oh, very thank informative you. and very insightful so so once again, thank you. And thanks for the work that you do. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, Croydon. You too. Have a good day. Okay. Bye-bye.